Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here, to see some familiar faces in the crowd. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, CryptoNets, about applying neural networks to encrypt the data. And it's a part of a bigger pro uh, project that we're working on, which tries to introduce privacy into AI. So it's quite a bit of a contrast to the previous talk we just heard. So the scenario that we're going to talk about is, is the following. So imagine you had your DNA sequenced. So you probably know that it's quite accessible now. You can get for about 100 bucks a file with your DNA. And the question I want you to think about is, what are you going to do with this file? So you know, there are many data scientists in the crowd today. And probably many of you would say, you, you should share this data because you can get a lot of value out of sharing this data. People may be able to give you predictions about some risk factor that you might have, some uh, traits that you, you can benefit from. So by all means, share this data. But if you go to privacy experts, they will tell you, hide this data. Actually, you're better off delete it altogether. Because if someone get their hands on this data, and if it happens to be the wrong people, you're in trouble. So imagine the next time you apply for a loan, and the bank tells you, look, it's not in your DNA to return the loan. I'm not going to grant you this loan. And actually, it's even worse. When you share your DNA with someone, you didn't sh just share your DNA. You shared the DNA of your kids. You shared the DNA of your brothers and sisters and, and your parents. So you didn't only infringe your own privacy, you infringed the privacy of your entire family. So there's quite a bit of contradiction here between you know, the value that we can get from the data and the risks associated with it. And it's not, it does not apply only to genetic data. It applies to many other forms of data, like financial data, uh, behavioral data, all sorts of places where we have information that we, you know, the people here in the, uh, in the crowd, know that there is value in this data. But we also understand the risk. Uh, that comes with sharing this kind of data. So here's what we propose doing. Imagine you could encrypt the data and send the encrypted data, obviously without the key, to the cloud that hosts these services that can give you all sorts of interesting predictions over your data. And then they can do whatever they want with the encrypted data because you know it's encrypted, they cannot do anything with it. And and just to make it clear, I'm not talking about kind of pseudo encryption, I'm talking about, you know, full blown encryptions. And so imagine they could work on this data and send you the results and you can decrypt it and read whatever predictions they've made on your behalf. So just to make it clear, they don't get to see your data because it's encrypted. They can still make accurate predictions, but they even don't get to see the results that they predicted because it all remains encrypted in the entire process. Only you can decrypt the data and see the results. So that's quite amazing. So let me start by just demonstrating a system that does just what we talked about. Let's see if we can switch to that. So this is a little demo that we've, we've built. Here we have, we have actually the DNA of a flower. It's not a DNA of a human being, but it's just the same. And we're trying to predict for a specific seed of this flower, how many days it will take it to blossom from the moment you'll seed it in the ground. Okay? So it's, it's a model, we have 200,000 SNPs. So speaking uh, uh, data science, it means 200,000 features. And the model, it's, 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 uh, in, in genomic models, most of them are just linear models, but still, it's pretty high dimensions. So, let me see if I get, yeah. So, once I click the button here, if all goes well, yes, we, we sent the request to the server. It took it two seconds to actually run the prediction on the encrypted data. So, the data was encrypted in the entire process. It took us about one additional second to download the result and to decrypt them. And to find that for this specific seed, it's going to take 29 days, point one, till it blossoms. But again, to make it clear, the data, the server didn't get to see anything. 
not only that it didn't get to get to see the DNA of the flower, it didn't see even the prediction that it made. Now, you know, people sometimes ask me, okay, but what would have happened if we didn't use encryption? You know, would it take three seconds or less? So I can tell you for sure, it would have been much, much faster. Much faster if you didn't get, uh, use encryption. But I think the relevant question is, are you willing to wait for three seconds in order to preserve your privacy? If it was your DNA now being sent in order to make a prediction of what is your risk to suffer from a certain disease, are you willing to wait for three seconds to make sure that this information does not leak to your bank? And if the answer is true, then this is quite practical. So let's switch back and talk about kind of what's under the hood. So what is the secret sauce here? The secret sauce is a, a encryption type that is called homomorphic encryptions. So it's a type of encryption that people in the crypto community were looking for for many decades. And Craig Gentry in 2009 managed to demonstrate the first implementation of this type of encryption. And what's so special about it is that it's an encryption that allows you to operate on the encrypted data while it's still encrypted. So for example, this is something that you can do with any encryption. You can take, imagine you have two numbers, x1 and x2, you can add them and then encrypt them, right? That, this is something that you can do with any encryption. But with homomorphic encryption, you can go the other way around. You can first encrypt and then add them together, right? And you can do this addition without knowing what the value of, of x1 and x2 are, without having the keys, and without even knowing the result. And you can do the same for multiplication. Again, any encryption allows you to take two numbers, multiply them, and then encrypt. But homomorphic encryptions allow you to go the other way around. You can first encrypt and then multiply. So fully homomorphic encryptions are encryptions that allow you to do both additions and multiplications over encrypted data. And why is it so special? Because with fully homomorphic encryptions, you can actually take any function that you can express as a Boolean circuit and apply it on encrypted data. That's quite powerful. But unfortunately, only in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, right? There is a gotcha. And the gotcha is that it's going to be very slow and very expensive in terms of storage. So for example, uh, storing one bit of data, of raw data, you'll have to encrypt it into something that will be of the order of one megabyte of data. And if you do, if you want to build the circuit of just for example, multiplying two integers and then apply it to encrypted integers, it's going to take you about, about 10 minutes just to do a single multiplication. So it's kind of a nice theoretical tool, but not very practical. But we can do better than that, right? I already showed you a demonstration in which we could do kind of a, a big dot product um, in, in just three seconds. So we can do better than that. So we, you might be disappointed at this time, but wait for it. So we have to talk about practical homomorphic encryption, not just kind of the generic form of uh, homomorphic encryption, but how do we make it practical? And in order to do that, we build the library. We call it the Simple Encrypted Arithmetic Library, SEAL. And you can download it, it's uh, open source. And actually, quite interesting, you know, several bloggers started writing on it, and one of them was kind of having a good day. So they complained about the use of homomorphic encryptions, and they suggested that we should use heteromorphic encryptions. We're still working on that part. The key into, uh, there are two keys into making homomorphic encryptions uh, practical. One is designing your computation carefully, and the other one is representing your data. And I'm going to touch on each one of these subjects. 
So first, let's talk about the design of the computation. So recall that homomorphic encryptions allow you to do multiplications and additions. So basically, the kinds of functions that you can compute are polynomials, right? Polynomials are, are, are functions that are made only of additions and multiplications. So you'd like to think about whatever you're trying to apply as a polynomial. But multiplications are much slower than additions. And not only that, they add a lot of noise, and if you apply multiplications on top of multiplications, at a certain point, the noise will be too high and you won't be able to decrypt the data. So that leads you into thinking about computing only low degree polynomials. If you want to be practical about using homomorphic encryption, you want to use only low degree polynomials. So what does it say when you want to use it on neural nets, for example? Right? So imagine you want to apply neural nets to the MNIST data set um, of 100 uh, digit, uh, digits. So here we have a, a, a neural net and kind of a schematic view of a neural net. You have the layers, you have the inputs at the bottom layer, the data propagates up, and every node, what it does, it does a weighted sum of some of the nodes uh, on the uh, layer below it, and then apply some nonlinearity, right? And now imagine we want to do it with homomorphic encryptions. So doing the weighted sum is quite, quite easy, right? It's just multiplication and addition. It's, it's a low degree polynomial. But the activation function, this is, this is trouble, right? Because the common activation function that we use are either the rectified linear units or sigmoids are not polynomials. And if we want to approximate them with polynomials, we're going to end up with pretty high degree polynomials, and that's going to be slow. So how do we go about it? So we think for a second. In terms of kind of machine learning, what do we need out of an activation function? The main thing that we need out of an activation function, we, we, we demand that it will be nonlinear. Because if it's linear, the entire structure of the neural net collapse. Now from crypto point of view, we want the activation function to be a low degree polynomial. So what is the lowest degree polynomial which is nonlinear? The square function, right? So we use a square activation function, okay? So that's kind of, that's just kind of a glimpse of the kind of techniques you use in order to make your computation more practical for using with homomorphic encryptions. The other thing is data representation. So it turns out that these homomorphic encryptions, all the homomorphic encryptions that have been uh, presented so far, they don't encrypt numbers. Actually, they encrypt polynomials. So the object that you encrypt is a polynomial and a pretty high degree polynomial. So typically, it could be something like of degree 4,000 or something like that. And, and now, you, you should ask yourself, how do I take the data that I want to apply the neural network uh, to and represent it as a polynomial? So obviously, I can, I can represent it as just a, a, sing, a, 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 a the constant polynomial. But that's going to be quite wasteful. It turns out that you can actually stack together a lot of things in a single polynomial. For example, in some cases, you can take multiple features and stack them together in a single, in a single polynomial. And this is actually what we've done in the DNA uh, example that I showed you before. In other cases, what we can do, we can take the same feature from multiple examples and stack them together. So now instead of sending a single example to be labeled at, uh, in every round, we're just gonna send them together. We kind of, we create these mini batches. And we enjoy what is kind of, in the hardware uh, world, is called single instruction multiple data. 
because whenever we apply some computation, we actually apply it simultaneously to the entire uh, feature set. So let me show you uh, another demonstration. And in this one, we're going to uh, actually apply an, uh, a neural net um, to the MNIST data set. It's not very responsive today. So again, what, what, do we see, what do we see here? We have the data encrypted and being sent to the server. And now we have, it's, it's really a neural net. So the neural net that we're applying here is a neural net that gets an accuracy of 99%. So it's not the state of the art that we get for MNIST, but if you go back three or four years, you know, that would be an award-winning net, right? So it has multiple layers and all the bells of, and whistles that you expect uh, from a neural net. It's not the 150 uh, layers uh, ResNet uh, network, but it's a, it's a quite a nice uh, network. And now we send a request to this network, and it's going to take it. It's going to take it about 80 seconds. It's, it's a more complex complication, uh, computation than the one we saw with the DNA. But what's special about it is that we are now sending not just a single request, we're actually stacking together 4,000 requests using this technique of data representation that I was talking about. So once it's going to be done, again, in about 20 seconds, we not only get the result for a single image, we're going to get the result for 4,000 images. Now, to make sure that you understand how secure is a service, the server can tell the difference between answering the request for a single image or 4,000 images. It can tell the difference. For it, it just see encrypted polynomials. Not only that it can't see the difference, in order to allow it to work on these kind of mini batches, we didn't have to change a line of code. Right? The same code that can be applied to a single image applies to 4,000 images. So here we see, you see it on, uh, on, the, on the left, you see the image in red. And this is the prediction, the larger the, the, the digit is kind of the confidence that the classifier had with respect to this uh, prediction. And I can go and go to the next image, and you see I get the immediate, immediately the next result because we already got the result because we, we, we were doing 4,000 predictions simultaneously. All right, so I can go and keep going. Um, so let's go back. So since we have we have a couple more minutes, let me show you even another demonstration. So here we have medical records of people that arrive in the hospital with pneumonia. So Pneumonia is a quite common disease, and for most people, the best treatment for pneumonia would be some antibiotics and chicken soup. So the, be the best thing that the hospital can do for you is to send you back home with antibiotics and rest for a few days. But actually, pneumonia is a deadly disease, and for some people, they need to be rushed uh, uh, to, the, to the emergency room in order to be treated if they have pneumonia. And this, and this uh, risk calculator tried to, t tried to tell the, help the physicians tell which kind of person are you. So it gets you medical records and make the prediction. And as you see here, it takes about 10 seconds to make the prediction. And the lower the value is, means that you have a lower risk. And again, as before, we can stack together the medical records of 4,000 people and get the predictions for all of them simultaneously without infringing their privacy. Something interesting about this model, this model uses a technique which is called, it's kind of an interpretable model, which means that the model itself is something that a physician can look at. And it's not just kind of this black box of neuronat, it's actually a, um, a model that the physician can look at and make sense of. Because the model, and I'm going to show you the model. Just a second. The model is actually made of graphs, so these red curves. And for example, if you look over there, you see the age on, on the left at the second row. 
And you see, the model thinks that as you age, your risk for pneumonia increases, which kind of makes sense, right? And for every parameter, you can see how the model treats these, uh, uh, the different parameters. And basically, the prediction is just the sum of these graphs. And again, we can apply it with, with the encryption so to preserve privacy. So to sum up, um, it is possible to keep privacy while making accurate predictions. So it's not necessarily true that getting value and privacy are contradicting terms. We can bridge between them. And homomorphic encryption can be practical. So I don't know how many of you heard of homomorphic encryption before this talk today, but if you did, many, many people treat it as kind of a nice theoretical toy and not a practical thing. But I hope I managed to convince you that at least for some applications, it's already practical. And if you're interested into venturing into this word, uh, world of homomorphic encryption, uh, you're uh, welcome to use our library. Uh, it's open source and we'll, happy to, we'll be happy to hear your feedback. Thank you very much.